first draft or first collection uh, result of um, uh, a rather superficial investigation into what could become um, uh, a short history of uh, abstraction in art theory and art history across the 20th century. Since, and this is really not a very risky hypothesis, uh, the theme, <laughs> abstraction is the dominant theme uh, of art history and art uh, theory uh, since the late 19th century. And it starts, as uh, Matteo has already uh, hinted, it starts uh, with the German art historian uh, Wilhelm Worringer, um, who in his uh, PhD or doctoral thesis, Abstraction and Empathy, um, which he finished in uh, 1908, and he printed in an amount of 25 copies. It was exactly the amount you needed in order to get the um, uh, doctoral degree. Um, but his brother, who was running a print shop, um, uh, printed a few more copies. And on a travel to Italy, he gave one of these copies um, to a German writer who then published a really enthusiastic um, review of this, um, uh, of this text, Abstraction and Empathy. Um, closer. closer? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, Abstraction and Empathy um, is based on um, his argument that empathy and abstraction rep respond to opposing relationships between human beings on one hand and the external world on the other hand. So Woringer writes, whereas the precondition of the urge to empathy is a happy pantheistic relationship to, of confidence between man and the external world, the urge to abstraction is the outcome of great unrest inspired in man by the phenomena of outside world. So this is a rather um, uh, um, dark or desperate perspective uh, on uh, the theme of abstraction. Um, he continues, uh, just as, desire, as the desire for empathy, as the basis for aesthetic experience finds satisfaction in organic beauty, so the desire for abstraction finds its beauty in the life renouncing inorganic, in the crystalline, in a word, in all abstract regularity and necessity. necessity. And I think we encounter here already all sorts of resentments that up to, up to today um, uh, yeah, rule kind of uh, mainstream uh, um, uh, resentments against uh, abstraction. Um, Worringer explains the desire to abstraction as Raumangst in German, yeah? a fear of the space among primitive cultures which lack control over nature and things. The abstraction of the primitive is opposed to the sophisticated technologies of empathy, mimesis, and identification, yeah, which in then um, is combined in the beautiful German term Einfühlung, yeah, uh, which is kind of untranslatable to English, um, which he assigns um, to ancient Greek and Renaissance period, which is characterized by the domination of nature through science. So Woringer's contribution to art theory, um, which and he was really obsessed by the past. He did not really consider at that moment uh, contemporary um, uh, uh, artistic practices such as uh, cubism. He published um, uh, his uh, thesis just one year um, after uh, Picasso uh, started with the first cubist paintings. Um, his, his contribution entered the circulation only by chance. On this travel to Italy, he gave it to this um, uh, writer and he published a, a review. And I think it is one of the very few books on art theory that since 1908 are constantly in print. Um, are co is, this book is permanently available. It's translated into a myriad of different languages and it forms the kind of canon. Um, besides the fact that already um, in the early, in the, in, the, in the 1910s or before the First World War, um, uh, it was of crucial and immense influence uh, to a number of contemporary artists who Woringer later branded himself as the Expressionists. So he invented the term Expressionism. Um, Kandinsky, Mark, Klee. So it seems very remarkable to me that abstraction appears in modernism as the absorption or consumption of what one would call today primitive otherness. I think this is something that we need to uh, keep in mind 
when we further elaborate and abstract on this topic. At the same time, to apply a concept of abstraction on primitive art was already back then, in um, the 1910s, uh, polemically criticized even before modernism became into full play. Um, Ernst Bloch wrote in 1915 a very critical um, review of Woringer and most prominently Ar Karl Einstein argued that the conception of space which appears in Cubism as abstraction has to be understood when it comes to African sculpture, so so-called primitive art. It has to be understood as the strongest form of realism. Yeah. So such a polemical and rather uh, paradoxical understanding of realism as a mediated or immediate abstraction which then allows to develop new understandings of space is further developed as soon as abstraction has become the ruling principle of a modern society which is based on a fully mechanized industrial production. Based on Russian constructivism, um, Brecht's theater employed a concept of making strange uh, or ostranenie as it is I think called in Russian, making the familiar unfamiliar. The real abstraction of the commodity form is countered by an aesthetic alienation which categorically refuses any possibility to identify or to sympathize or to develop this kind of empathy in uh, the words of Woringer or Einfühlung. The, action, the acting of Brecht's actors is overdetermined in the sense of an overlap of a certain superimposition of the consciousness of the actor and the figure in order to struggle against abstract determination. There's always a decision which has been made and this decision can be criticized. Abstraction as an aesthetic strategy appears here as an overaffirmation which enables and empowers the audience to learn about the realities surrounding them. This is the kind of famous fourth wall uh, to the audience that Brecht is um, uh, tearing down. It is supposed to alter the perception uh, of an easily understandable object or concept and it forces us to think about it in more complex ways. So rather than reducing complexity, uh, aesthetic abstraction calls for the capacity to to, to deal with an uh, increased con complexity that we uh, experience in uh, the so-called outside world. Um, it produces difference, or as if, if you want to put it with Derrida, difference insofar as it both, it differs and it differs in a world governed by empty, dead, and automized repetition of the same. So, for Marx, and I mean, maybe it gets a bit redundant here now because we are of course all referring to similar sources and similar debates for, of the 1960s and 70s. For Marx, abstraction precedes thought. I think this is also um, something that uh, you have introduced as far as I understood. And it's um, the um, German uh, theorist, Alfred Sohn Rethel, who has identified this as the kind of absolutely irreconcilable contradiction between the real abstraction in Mar Marx and the thought abstraction in the theory of language. In his uh, quite audacious project yeah, of a, of a rereading of Marx with Kant, yeah, this is why um, Adorno didn't allow him to enter the Frankfurt School because uh, Horkheimer apparently said, uh, we have already one crazy, crazy guy in Benjamin, uh, we don't need another one. Um, so Son Rethel was not allowed to join the Frankfurt School and he um, uh, followed up on this project from the early 1920s until his death in 1973. Um, and it was only, I think, uh, a few years because before he died that it was published um, um, in the Surkamp Publishing House. Um, uh, his uh, big project on uh, um, manual and int intellectual labor. Um, in, his, in this project, um, Son Rethel argues that it is the action of exchange and the action alone that is abstract. So abstraction is an activity, a social activity. Abstraction does not originate in man's minds, 
but in their actions. It is complete absence of quality, Sonreto continues, a differentiation purely by quantity and by applicability to every kind of commodity and service which can occur on the market. And I think this is something um, uh, very, very relevant uh, if you look at the global uh, art world today. This means before thought could arrive at the level of poor abstraction, think of Kant and the alignment, um, the abstraction was already at work in the social effectivity of the market, in the abstraction of the commodity form. There is a kind of secret identity of value form and thought form, which makes the whole discussion about abstraction uh, so difficult. Abstraction is both a, a thought becoming a thing, according to Virno, but also a relation or a thing which becomes a thought. And this is the line that Sonretel uh, opens up, and I think it's very important to see this uh, as two sides of um, the medal. Um, Alberto Toscano puts it uh, very brilliantly, abstraction is rooted in social practice, but at the same time, social life is practically abstract. Sonretel suggests Marx's notion of social form as an abstraction other than that of thought, or as an abstraction that is very different to a kind of uh, abstraction of thought. And it, he links here technology and abstraction through social practice, and this is why um, the, the, the question of the division of labor, in the division of manual intellectual labor uh, becomes so constitutive for capitalism, and I think this is something uh, that is also absolutely uh, uh, relevant and important uh, when we talk about so-called cognitive capitalism or uh, knowledge production or immaterial production. Today, cognitive capitalism turns the abstractions themselves into objects of investment and speculation. And this requires new modes and new critiques of real abstractions that are rooted in social and artistic practices. In uh, Cremonini, Painter of the Abstract, uh, this is a short text from uh, August 1966, Louis, Louis Althusser uh, writes about visiting the Venice Biennial. And while he was standing in the room with several paintings of uh, Leonardo Cremonini, he experiences a situation which reoccurred to me in the past few days um, in a myriad of different ways and in countless times. Althusser, he's, here's two uh, people um, entering the room and he hears them making an ultra-fast comment by saying, uninteresting, expressionism, let's leave the room, let's move on, and leaving the room instantly. So Althusser sees the term expressionism, which, as I mentioned, was first coined by Woringer, as an indication of a terrific misunderstanding. The ruling misunderstanding in contemporary art criticism, which, when it does not dress up its judgments in the esotericism of a vocabulary communicating no more than the complicity of accomplices in ignorance, but consents to speak a plain language, reveals to one and all that it is no more than a branch of taste, um, which is of gastronomy. <laughs> this, I think, is uh, quite a, a bold statement. Um, Althusser rejects an art criticism which is obsessed with the mysteries of the subjectivity of the painter who inscribes his creative project in the ideal ma materiality of his creation. The aesthetics of consumption and the aesthetics of creation are merely one and the same. I think this is something um, absolutely uh, remarkable when we talk about creative industries, since both depend on the ideological categories of the subject and the object. Thus, the subjectivity of creation is no more than a mirror reflection of the subjectivity of consumption. And Cremonini, this is why Althusser is so fascinated with his paintings, it's a figurative painter, um, Cremonini instead is not interested in subjects and objects, but in the relations between things and their men or women. As a painter of the abstract, rather than an abstract painter, he makes us see not the relations between the painter and his work, but the relations between a work and its painter. Um, Benjamin Noyes has elaborated further uh, on this text of Al Althusser. Um, we have no image of capital. Capital itself is a kind of pure relationality, a pure abstraction of value, labor, and accumulation, which can only be seen in negative. This is why the negation of real abstractions demands further abstraction, as abstraction is the only possible means to reveal this pure relationality, which conceals itself in plain sight. 
In this context, I think it is also uh, interesting, and like I said, this is just uh, it's rather elliptic and uh, just a few notes. In this context, and um, certainly one has to elaborate further on this, it is absolutely crucial uh, to revisit the work of Jean-Marie Straub and Daniel Huyer um, as a kind of uh, abstract um, uh, forensic poetry on the highest level of uh, of abstraction. There is a film in, uh, I think, the Itali Italian Pavilion, um, uh, History Lessons, um, uh, a film by uh, Jean-Marie Straub uh, installed. Um, I just would briefly point uh, to um, uh, Deleuze's uh, uh, yeah, um, reading uh, of um, the uh, abstraction in Straub or in the films of the Straubs. We only see the deserted ground, but this deserted ground seems heavy with, with what lies underneath it. You might ask, how do we know what lies underneath it? That is precisely what the voice is telling us. As if the earth were buckling from what the voice is telling us. It is that which comes to take its place underground when ready. If the voice speaks to us of corpses, of the lineage of corpses which comes to it take its place underground at that moment, then the slightest whisper of wind on the deserted land, on the empty space that you have before your eyes, the smallest hollow in this earth will all take on meaning. Um, I think there has been a very interesting discussion um, in the past few years um, on this problem of the abstract um, uh, in uh, um, relation to contemporary art and to uh, no new divisions of labor and new forms of uh, immaterial production or the passage from uh, industrial to post-industrial uh, production. Um, uh, I just want to pick a uh, three more or less um, arbitrary examples. Uh, Liam Gillick uh, on, one, uh, on one hand, Liam Gillick and the kind of post-modernism of relational aesthetics um, he argues that there is a failure of the abstract which promises an abstraction that it cannot deliver. Art is the concretization of the abstract into a series of failed forms. I think this puts in a very, very interesting way um, uh, the whole ideology of uh, relational aesthetics um, as, a post, as a genuinely postmodern uh, project. Um, uh, yeah. Um, there was a very interesting um, uh, uh, exhibition that Maria Lind um, curated for Tensta Kunsthall in Stockholm, uh, which was called The Abstract Possible. And I um, see it as a kind of revisiting um, of estrangement strategies or Brechtian strategies yeah, as an act of imminent critique. Um, it was a highly controversial exhibition um, which basically left no space um, for kind of built-in or embedded critique as it is a kind of norm uh, nowadays. Um, uh, it was a more uh, almost theatrical demonstration um, of uh, what, um, um, how, how, the, how the art world or the art market uh, uh, operates today. Um, and a third, uh, Basam El Baroni um, has developed in how to do things with theory a very interesting approach um, this spring um, uh, and he argues that there is a gradual erasure of criticality in contemporary artistic discourse, a shift into what uh, can be dubbed the post-critical by eliminating um, negativity from its spectrum. And this can also be a result of a further, further, further abstraction um, that, uh, yeah, uh, we lose the kind of um, uh, uh, moment of criticality um, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in this um, push. But uh, is there really a chance for a return to the concrete, as I think uh, many would argue for? Um, this uh, eternal return of raising consciousness um, uh, uh, as it is uh, coined in art as uh, activism, can we really transcend the limits of the art world and its real abstractions and uh, pseudo-concretizations? Uh, I think these are um, very, very important questions. I would like to conclude by referring to the theme of this evening, uh, the idea of abstract strike, and I would like to um, uh, introduce this um, again, quoting Karl Einstein, um, who argued that the history of art is a struggle between all optical experiences, invented spaces, and representations. 
And I think this is not only a nice take on Marx, yeah, I think uh, it's, um, uh, it uh, opens up um, to a concept of the abstract or abstract strike, um, uh, which has a huge potential if you understand it as a history of struggles. Um, we have to rethink and reevaluate strike as an epistemological device. This is what we uh, started to discuss Wednesday afternoon. And rather than as, then seeing it um, merely or primarily as a form of protest, I think it is the only possibility for us to experience the very contradictions of real abstraction and aesthetic abstraction. And this is precisely due to a social practice of withdrawal, becoming absent while still being there. And this would reveal the contemporary conditions of creativity without mirroring it as a kind of advanced consumerism, as Althusser would argue. Certainly it will allow us to make the uncanny familiarity of the art world strange and rather unfamiliar again. It might differ and differ in a literal sense of the word. But this means that we have to face the most difficult challenge of form, which might be capable of refu refusing both value form and thought form. How not to make art within the art world? The result, no matter whether it's failing, will be a new notion of social form. It will be based on an understanding of art as resistance against communication, as Deleuze put it once uh, beautifully in a lecture on Straub. It is resistance against the sharing of opinions, the exchange of everything that is made exchangeable, and the communication of communicability. It is political as a production of reality, an augmentation of reality, through the production of vision of a different kind. It's a transformation of how we see rather than what we see.